will begin our discussion on colonialism and print in India. The coming of print in India, print to India really begins with the coming of the Europeans, because the printing machines as they are imported into this country will uh, initiate the process of printing and replacing the manuscript culture. But in order to actually begin the discussion on printing, uh, we first will spend a little bit of time on uh, understanding certain key concepts of colonialism, which inform our lecture today. For many of you, these are concepts which are very fundamental and rudimentary in the study of history and colonialism. And uh, today's lecture might uh, seem to be a repeat. Uh, for the rest, you can uh, look at some of these fundamentals and read on your own to be able to uh, grasp uh, more about this particular theme. Uh, colonialism, the coming of colonialism to India, the establishment of colonialism to, uh, in India is a fascinating journey. Uh, I am not saying it is a very enjoyable journey, especially for us Indians, but uh, it certainly tells us, it, is, it, it tells us a lot about how political and cultural processes work in tandem and uh, also like any study of history helps us understand uh, our, our present day realities better. The first point that I would like to make is that there is a linkage between capitalism and colonialism. When I say cap colonialism is a was a consequence of capitalism, I am what I mean is really that the history of colonialism cannot be understood without the history of capitalism and indeed vice versa. You cannot understand fully the history of capitalism uh, without understanding the history of uh, colonialism. And for that let us go back to one of the slides that we had in one of our earlier lectures, which explains the processes of capitalism, you know, what are some of the important uh, elements in players in the in the in, in within the capitalist mode uh, of production? Uh, we have the capitalist who brings in capital. So, capital is an important resource. You have labor who is engaged by capital, works on the raw material. The raw material has to be has to be garnered and also then the goods that are produced are sold in the market and then a profit is generated. This profit can be regurgitated and put back into the kitty of capital and uh, a, a large part of the profit could be put back and in, leads to an increase in capital. Now, this puts into place a cyclical process, a cyclical process in the way that once a, a particular industry, a particular firm is able to generate enough profit, it, it sort of establishes more capital, it brings about brings in more capital. But in order to for this increased capital to be able to operate, it needs two things. One is access to raw materials, right. Now, this access to raw materials is something that you, 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 you have to then gather through primary resources, either through mining or through agriculture. In case of cash crops, let us say cotton cultivation or indigo cultivation would require or timber would require, you know, more raw materials for that capital to work on. The cap a limited capital can only work on a limited amount of raw material. And once the material is produced, it needs to be sold in the market, that market size of the market also has to grow. Which is why within capitalism, if there is competition between capitalists who are operating within the same industry, let us say the textile industry. There is always a cap contest of market. So, when one capitalist tries to expand, that capitalist is, is, is sort of uh, 
uh, expands through taking over somebody else's market. Now, within the spirit of cap, uh, uh, competition, that that would be fine because in this this particular case, the competition is going to increase the quality of goods and reduce the prices for the consumer. However, what what colonialism does is allows capitalism to go and capture new markets and capture newer sources of raw materials. So, what the Europeans would do is go to these uh, lands and, and produce the additional raw material, the additional cotton, which is then brought back to the metropolis, to Europe, processed, made into textiles and then sold back into larger markets, which are global without coming into these intercapitalist rivalries between the various European countries. These rivalries that are spread all across the world in the form of empire, right. Uh, and, and that leads to these intercapitalist uh, inter-European wars across uh, the globe in Africa, in Asia and in Americas, right. So, we see how how the how the how capitalism is intrinsically linked to capital, uh, to to colonialism because in order to for capitalism to advance itself it requires uh, the expansion of of territory and an empire building becomes an important exercise right and we see that uh, you know slavery is also another very important and the history of colonialism also another very important um, uh, element for us to understand in the understanding industrial society. The industrial revolution as we understand in, in Europe uh, develops on the back of the colonial and uh, uh, ex colonial exploitation and the slave trade. The riches that are produced go on to building the big glorious cities of Europe uh, and, and that is a, that's a historic lead that the north has over the south through the exploitation of the south through colonial, uh, colonialist ventures. Colonialism in that way can be regarded as the first phase of globalization, where it was a globalization of capitalist ex exploitation, where the riches then flowed to the metropolitan countries. To, and, and those are the, those are historical leads, those are historical advantages which Europe and European uh, 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 Europe and the larger West uh, has. So, if we understand the West as those places where Europeans have settled, uh, then those countries have a historic lead over the South, uh, historic advantage over the South through the history of colonialism, and that is something for us to understand. Now, how, how did this get framed culturally? We look, look, looked at the economic argument, we also know the political, uh, we looked at the uh, economic uh, picture and we also know the political picture that uh, it was a case where the need was for a capitalist exp uh, expansion, for economic exam expansion and indeed most of these. Um, most of these uh, ventures began as a company, the East India Company, where the Dutch East India Company, the French East India Company and the British East India Company and there were other companies as well. What came as a logic for trade? The first time that the, uh, the Europeans came to India, they sought permission to conduct trade, right. But in order to be able to conduct the trade un, in an unbridled manner, the exploitation in an unbridled manner, they, re, they realized that they needed to control political power, right. And so, began the story of political uh, subjugation of the colonized races. But how did it play out in the form of uh, a cultural logic? Now, what we do understand is that overarching the meta narrative of, of on which colonialism built itself was that of a civilizing mission. Now, who were the targets of this meta narrative? Who were, were these uh, this this uh, this these ideas targeted towards? There were two audiences. 
One was a domestic audience for the colonizers. The, uh, within their own country, they had to convince people to support this colonial venture, support in, in form of providing men and money, who uh, they needed uh, people to run the companies, they needed uh, clerks, they needed uh, administrators, they needed soldiers who would come and manage the empire for them. So, that kind of support was necessary, that what they, what they are engaged in is, is a positive and a good exercise, it is not an evil exercise. And the second was also to prevent any, any, any backlash from within the community, within, within the European community. The other was, uh, other audience was that of the colonizers themselves. The colonizers had to be told that colonialism actually good for them, so, so as to create consent, so as to make the colonized peoples actually support the empire. In fact, uh, much of uh, British and French colonialism dependent on, on, on the, the colonizers as those who ran the administration and fought in the wars, fought all the colonial wars. So, what was this meta narrative of civil, uh, civilizing mission? Let us go through it for a moment. Through various travelogues, now we, we in our lectures on uh, the effect of colonialism on Europe or of print on Europe, uh, sorry. Uh, we looked at how uh, there was a great hunger for knowledge of the new world and it was not that this new knowledge was always scientific. There was a lot of spurious knowledge that went in, in fact that is something that we remarked on in, in our lecture that there was always a tussle between that which is uh, which is scientifically valid and that which is based on imagination and uh, prejudice and assumptions. So, there were a lot of assumptions which were about these non-European lands and much of these assumptions were building on previous traditions of, of, uh, of uh, people outside the known world that is the European and uh, Asian world. That the, the, that the Europeans regarded uh, the non-European peoples as, uh, as uh, abnormal, as subhuman or non-human and therefore, they translated it into uh, being monstrous. So, the, the books and travelogues would sometimes be so imaginative as to portray uh, some of these lands as those which are, uh, which have uh, monstrous characteristics, you know. And, uh, and this is, this is a very early um, uh, travelogue, so in the 14th century print had not yet come into being, so the, these would be woodcuts which would be printed images onto manuscripts uh, to begin with. Right. So, these fed into the imagination, these kind of tropes, these kind of ideas uh, kept on occurring. Uh, these non-European lands were treated as, as ex exotic places and so, this particular uh, travelogue, the travels of John Mandeville uh, says, there grew there in India a wonderful tree without which bore tiny lambs on the ends of its branches. Now, these are of course, fantastical beings and creatures, which were presented as, as that which were real. Now, it is not that everybody believed it, but this led into the, this fed into as well as built upon the overall assumptions uh, of, of these non-European lands as places which one had to be cautious about, places which were somehow different from Europe. Uh, there were also reports of non-Europeans as cannibals, so, various kinds of negative images that were coming about. 
who would uh, so they are dangerous. Then that, so these are various kinds of stereotypes that were that uh, that were being built. The various kinds of tropes that were feeding into the popular imagination. Certainly, there would be uh, factual sources as well, um, but it was as I had discussed during uh, the, the discussion on coming of print, it was very difficult to actually for, for an ordinary person to actually differentiate from between fact and fiction, because both had the same form and were presented in a similar fashion. It till, till such time that you had the creation of the journals and the academic communities and the uh, and the various uh, uh, scholarly bodies there was no authentication of the kind of uh, stories that were being passed off as facts then there was a presentation of non europeans and immo uh, as immoral it wasn't that uh, completely that the academies were uh, not prejudiced they also had their prejudices but those prejudices worked on very very specific themes uh, so, this is a presentation of, of a harem in, 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 the, in the eastern world, in the oriental world. The orient is presented as immoral and non-Europeans as sensuous. Uh, this some of you might identify as the famous um, cover image of uh, Edward Said's orientalism, where uh, uh, this is snake charmers a group uh, 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 performing and a group of men sort of uh, looking at the body of a naked boy and that entire experience of watching of, of the performative is, is sort of presented as a sensuous exam, um, example of sensuousness uh, within the eastern practices. On the other hand, the Europeans were presented as civilized by presenting the non-Europeans as immoral, as barbaric, as uh, you know uncivilized and monstrous, the European presented this, their own self as the civilized. So, this is a famous what you are seeing is a famous uh, painting of uh, uh, America West, Amerigo Vespucci um, awakening the sleeping America. So, America is presented as a woman who is naked and lying and sleeping and it is it is Amerigo Vespucci the, the traveler who who is said to have discovered America, who comes and wakes, uh, wakes America up. Now, this is an extremely patriarchal image of course, it uses the it uses the patriarchal trope of the male domination over the female body as a trope of the domination of the colonizer over the coloni uh, colonized lands and America wakes up and takes note of this new lordship. Of course, Amerigo Vespucci is fully clothed and there behind lies the ship and the water sort of, uh, uh, so, uh, sort of beyond the horizon lies Europe and this is an image of the new land. These are all imaginative creations right and this all these tropes sort of lead into this overarching image of the civilizing mission and within the civilizing mission there was there is the there is the you know logic of the the natives accepting this civilizing mission or being grateful for the civilization mission so the image that is there is an image of um, you know the east offering its riches to britannia as it as a as a tribute um, a tribute to uh, to the enlightenment that that Europe is going to bring bring to them, and uh, certainly you can look at the colors of the skin color, making that distinction between the European and the dark 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 races. And the the if you if you look at the plate, there is a sort of a diagonal uh, um, break between the two frames, where there is the good and the evil, the uh, the white and the dark uh, skins. And this kind of tropes sort of and we know that Africa was known as the dark continent, darkness as in the evilness of Africa the, and uh, those of us who have read Conrad, uh, we know the uh, story of heart of darkness when Kudz moves further and further into Africa, he, he gives, gives over to the evil. So, this association between blackness and evil uh, 
between uh, 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 between the non europeans and evil this association of race also becomes a, 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 a very important sort of theme within this uh, uh, within this uh, culture that uh, cultural explanation of colonialism and the justification is also presented in this particular image that that the east is grateful to europe and therefore offering its own riches to europe voluntarily right and europeans uh, and in various uh, uh, literature in images within the iconography europeans are presented as masters of the universe they are looking at they are, they are the true owners of the world entire globe you know here it is an image of uh, of queen elizabeth the first after the this this was an image uh, painting which was created after the defeat of the spanish armada you can see those um, the image of uh, some of some, some ships on the wall uh, uh, another painting and uh, elizabeth has her hand her right hand on the, on the globe because shows the controls after the defeat of the spanish armada that inter imperialist rivalry over the control over the uh, over the atlantic is uh, complete when sir walter raleigh uh, marshals the um, british navy uh, the queen's navy to uh, to defeat the uh, spanish armada and thereby take control over and since then the british empire keeps on growing right so this idea that the european rulers uh, rule the universe and that they are the rightful rulers of the, of the universe the civilizing mission was also cocooned within this idea of the white man's burden that it is the uh, it is the the job it is the ordained it is it is a very tough job for the white man the white man is not voluntarily doing it it uh, they are doing it because it is some kind of a, a, a of a mission it's a, it is almost a, a uh, it is almost a you know uh, a divine uh, a divine uh, commandment to actually civilize the rest of the world to convert everybody into christians to take the light of the enlightenment of the renaissance into it there were both these strains the religious strain and the secular strain so the religious strain was that europeans the missionaries would go and spread the uh, the word of, of of Jesus of Christ across to these uh, hidden races, and uh, the secular line was of course that of science and uh, and education, where uh, the European uh, colonizers would set up schools and educational institutions and build roads and railways and other sort of uh, advancements of modern uh, modern civilization, bring uh, the advancements of modern civilization into these worlds. Uh, of course, these advancements of modern civilization were catered to actually uh, uh, greater exploitation of, of, of the colonial uh, 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 lands of the, of the colonies themselves, because like the railways or the roads would ensure that various uh, uh, goods and raw materials would travel easier. Most of these lines were connecting the hinterland to the ports. right? Uh, and what you see in this image is a, is a particular advertisement for a particular uh, brand of soap, which, which um, really uh, um, crystallizes this idea of colonialism that the white man in conducting all the work around and if you can see uh, that small little image by the bottom right hand corner of the white man uh, giving some arms or blessings to this black man who is sitting down abject uh, 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 subjugated uh, all these ventures lead to, uh, to dirtying of their hands you know the, certainly these places are dirty and what, uh, the only thing that the uh, that the uh, soap brand of soap can do is to lighten that burden that uh, and wash that dirt off the hands to clean uh, the white man uh, white man after he has been engaged in this civilizing mission certainly uh, science too aided uh, the the um, the creation of this sense of european superiority uh, it uh, give a sense that uh, 
the European map, the, the, at the top, uh, at the top left hand that you see is the, is the epitome of, of civilization, it is the most advanced form of humanity. The, the mongoloid and the African and the Asian races are, are below that in order of, of that uh, order of evolution and the European man is really the supreme. Uh, and this story of, of colonialism was repeated uh, in a, through history. The Europeans wherever they went, they wrote, uh, wrote the histories, tried to write the histories of these lands. History is certainly a very modern discipline, um, based on collection of facts and interpretation of those facts. And uh, mm, uh, so, so notionally, hi history has to depend on uh, uh, some, some collected facts. Uh, after that, it could be a matter of, in, uh, 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 matter of interpretation. And really, um, the, uh, within the academic discipline of history, this act of interpretation and reinterpretation has to be based on uh, finding of newer facts or, or corroborating facts or disproving cert uh, certain facts in order to make a different uh, sort of argument. This which is very different from earlier ways of talking about the past, which would be on the basis of recollection or imagination rather than on the basis of uh, factual history. And when the Europeans uh, uh, wrote uh, the history of India, they typically talk, uh, divided the history of India into three periods, the Hindu period, the Muslim period and the British period. Very curiously, the third period is not a Christian period. Now, this is a very top down approach of writing history by identifying the peoples by, by the rulers. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, so even though there were, um, let us say, um, uh, Hindu rulers in, in uh, 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 during that uh, particular period. Uh, not all the people were Hindus at that point of time. We do understand that uh, Buddhists and Jains were also a very, very large population and Buddhism was born in India. And uh, uh, in the first millennia, Buddhism was, uh, did, did uh, occupy a very large uh, geography. Of it. Uh, was followed in a very large geography of this country. Um, and certainly when the Muslim period occurs, not all, all people of India were Muslims, right. So, this is a very top down approach, it identifies the religion of the ruler. But in the case of the British period, um, uh, they do not identify by the religion of the ruler, but rather a secular definition of the national nationality of the ruler, right. So, now how are these three periods really? Uh, really interpreted. Uh, no matter what the story of, of these, um, uh, these stories are, it, uh, it, they project, they try to project that it is the coming of the British that actually works as, as some kind of a liberatory force on, on, on India. India was in a, in a state of um, uh, darkness, in a state of chaos and it is only by the, when the coming, of, when the British come about that India actually gets united, you know, this kind of a, a larger map of India. Cartography also becomes a very important sort of channel through which this history is, is projected, this kind of a idea of the empire is projected. So, uh, this kind of an united picture of India was something that uh, the British said did not exist before the coming of, in, uh, uh, coming of the British to India, coming of the Europeans to India. Uh, there was a lot of chaos, there was a lot of infighting. Among, among Indian rulers at that point of time. And th that worked to justify European rule within this uh, uh, subcontinent. But there were two competing views of, uh, uh, of uh, Indian history between the Orientalists and the Anglicists. Now, uh, I do not have the occasion here to actually explore this, but this debate between Orientalism and Anglicism is part of a larger uh, debate within Europe, within Britain, uh, between Romanticism and Classicism. The Neoclassicals had a, had a different way of looking at uh, the world, whereas the Romantics had a very different way of looking at the world, had a, had a critique of, 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 uh, of uh, uh, the Neoclassical view, uh, viewpoint. But to understand uh, the workings of the um, British um, colonialists, 
within India, we can we can look at uh, some of the things that the Orientalists did. Um, you know, the Orientalists, people like uh, William Jones and Max Muller, they they worked on uh, some uh, translating some of the very very uh, important uh, what today are important uh, texts. Uh, man, they hunted out these manuscripts. They managed to discover them, then translate them into into English and bring it to modern study. And uh, they presented them as a mark of the glory of in, uh, of India that that has somehow been lost. On the other hand, you had the Anglicists, someone like um, like James Mill, who wrote this history of British India, to show that India uh, uh, India really. Uh, was an inglorious country, and it is only with the coming of the British that that uh, India rises to civilization. In fact, I would like to mention one more important individual, and that is uh, Charles Babington Macaulay. Many of you may have heard of, about it, or you can find more about Macaulay, uh, who, who who tried to suggest when he tries to suggest what path uh, India British ed, um, system of education in India should take. He argued that it should be based on the best texts of, of uh, emerging from, uh, from England, from Britain, rather than uh, based on texts which are uh, based in India. Because he said, he suggested that Indian texts have nothing, to, nothing good about them. There is no, they are not worth a, a, an entire, uh, a single shelf of European literature. The entire uh, literature that has been produced in all history in Asia. Uh, is not worth even a single shelf of European literature. That was the argument made by Macaulay and he dismissed the idea that uh, the education system should, should, should um, uh, include Indian texts uh, within, the, within the syllabi. Uh, and uh, so, so this, if you look at this uh, comparison between these com uh, comparative views, both, both the views are agreed on, 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 uh, on uh, justified that British need to rule India. The British are right in ruling India. British have a have a have a purpose in ruling India. Uh, however, the justification came came uh, uh, were, were divergent. Whereas the Orientalists uh, felt that uh, that uh, uh, the British rescued India from a tyrannical Muslim rule, the Anglicists felt that the British rescued India from tyranny and barbarism, irrespective of the Muslim rule. The Orientalists felt that uh, the Hindu period was glorious, and it is the coming of Islam that led India into a very dark period, and uh, uh, India had to be rescued from this. Uh, the, the Hindus really had to be rescued from this position of barbarism, which um, and tyranny that uh, Muslim rule has brought about. Whereas um, Anglicism disagreed and said there is nothing glorious about India, and the British are basically civilizing. India uh, 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 completely, uh, and that is their task, and they will continue to do so till such time that the Indians are able to rule themselves. A time which may never come. Now, what were the, some of the institutions through which these ideas were percolated down within this colony? Uh, uh, how were the Indians told that this is this is the logic of the civilizing mission? This is what. Uh, this is why colonialism is justified, and th that's why many Indians actually felt uh, that uh, you know they should support the empire and they should stand with the with the British because the British are doing something good to this country. Very importantly, the establishment of the education system. Whenever a particular ideological position tries to establish itself. Within within a larger uh, 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 and set up uh, a, a certain political rule, one of the important uh, points of intervention is the educational system, because remember the educational system are always dealing with young people, people whose ideas about the world are being formed, and and then they are going to get into responsible positions and. Uh, and and rule the country and help help uh, uh, you know shape the society so it, in order to shape the future you cannot work on minds which have already been formed but you have to work on minds which are young and therefore any any ideological position when it tries to intervene and change uh, uh, the social structure and political uh, uh, you know assumptions 
they, they intervene through educational institutions. The other is the legal system, L framing of laws of a particular kind and the judiciary, the police, the administration in implementing those laws. Make sure that any form, any particular kind of, uh, uh, kind of resistance or uh, rebellion to this new hegemony is, is, is sort of crushed. So, anybody who does not uh, agree with, with the, with the, with the Europe, uh, European uh, hegemony uh, would, 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 ha would, would be tackled through the legal system, through the police system. Okay. But very important uh, are, is, is culture, uh, you know, uh, the cultural system, uh, the creation of literature, lit the literature, uh, literary forms. Um, the arts, the architecture, uh, novels and poetry and drama allow people to imagine a new world. Before the new world, a uh, different world comes into being, it allows for people to believe in alternative world uh, or, or imagine what an alternative world could be. So, therefore, colonialism works in a way in which it, it, it is able to uh, uh, work in that space and tell people that the world that they have is it could be much better with colonialism all right that colonialism is a, a, is a justification all the various uh, images that i displayed to you uh, in 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 uh, uh, in the course of this lecture were conveyed to the colonial population through these various means architecture was a very important means through which uh, buildings which were pub uh, which were which were public by nature, which, which occupied public space, um, would impress upon uh, impress upon the colonial population of the greatness of their rulers. Communications, uh, newspapers played a very important role. What is what is happening in the world? The, the particular interpretation of what what is happening in the world uh, was one very important way in which um, uh, the colonizer operated in in putting in place this uh, idea of uh, the rightful rulership of the Europeans and practices, social customs and ceremonies played a very important role. The way in which certain European clubs operated or the certain ways in which Indians were supposed to behave uh, before uh, Europeans at, at a very, at an everyday level. At a larger level, um, you know, you had the darbars, where, where the various uh, princely states would come and play, pay their homage to the European ruler, to the to the to the British crown, whenever the crown visited, or the ordering of the colonial cities, the civil lines, the cantonment, um, the bazaars. Okay, so these were separated. Okay, the certain part of the city would be meant for the cantonment area, certain part will be meant for the European civilian population, a certain part would be meant in for the administrative. So, if you look at Delhi for example, the Lutens Delhi is, uh, is that part of the de uh, of the high, high power and for Indians there are the bazaars uh, all right and this was true of Calcutta as well, because Calcutta the previous capital of this uh, of the British empire. Um, you had the uh, the e European areas, you know, the Park Street, the the Esplanade, you know, uh, and these were the these were the Dalhousie. The these were some of the important European areas of the city, whereas the bazaars were uh, f uh, further north, uh, were towards uh, uh, north of the city, uh, and uh, that is where a lot of the action on the print uh, uh, in, in India also happens, in, in, in Calcutta also happens. So, really these are various kinds of ways in which the, the social landscape, the colonial, the, the ceremony, social practices, they also give us a sense of how uh, Indians viewed or how Indians um, behaved with uh, Europeans or encountered Europeans. Right. Uh, however, any form of hegemony produces its resistance and uh, the early resistance is before the real political national movement comes about 
you know the early resistance to colonial hegemony takes place through um, through various forms one is this uh, is creation writing of literature again uh, i told you the that the literature is one way in which literature and art uh, allows the mind to imagine um, imagine uh, a newer world so if if colonialism is using it to to create hegemony literature can also be created to question that hegemony then indians also tried to set up alternative educational institutions outside the purview of european um, uh, 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 european educational institutions um, then there were two other uh, uh, sort of uh, responses one was that of social reform trying to uh, modernize uh, the the indian social uh, rules customs so the abolition of sati the widow remarriage act these were uh, these were particular legislations these were particular social actions which took place and there were some important religious movements as well which tried to reform religion modern, try to modernize re religion make it more uh, more more uh, akin to uh, the kind of uh, social milieu that coloni uh, colonization was creating and on the other hand there was the response of social and cultural conservatism a kind of a cultural nationalism that um, uh, was uh, sought to be shaped uh, uh, trying to protect um, certain cultural practices uh, from from the uh, from the uh, intervention from uh, european uh, rulers uh, for instance one of the one very important uh, way was to actually control uh, over women you know a lot of lot of people a lot of uh, indians were uh, against uh, women's education um, because they felt that uh, they needed to protect that women were were sort of the were identified with the with culture and 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 the the space of culture and uh, and they didn't want colonial the colonizer to actually have uh, a say over the way um, within indian society women were treated so uh, so that's just one example there were other kinds of examples for example in the form of food habit in the form of clothing so cultural conservatism was another very important uh, aspect one can do an entire course on colonialism hopefully some of you might be enthused into looking into some of these issues uh, this discussion will prepare us for for the for the um, discussion on further discussion on on the coming of print and the role print actually played played in 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 relating to and learning from colonialism but resisting colonialism what were some of the implications of it uh, uh, we will we will ch uh, be able to understand by looking closely at the workings and the development of print in india